All right. Well, we do have a yeah, we've got a few folks on the phone. So obviously people will uh, will go ahead and join us as they roll in. Um, I'm going to go ahead and kick things off. So my name is Dr. David Schweibisch. I'm a uh, the current secretary of the Florida Podiatric Medical Association. I practice in Brevard County, Florida, kind of in the backyard of uh, SpaceX and NASA and all the uh, the goings on with the Space Force right now. Um, I'm uh, very privileged to be on this call this evening, kind of as uh, one of many lectures within the Young Practitioner series that the FPMA is going to be hosting in, in coming months and years. Um, this is a talk that's really geared toward folks. A lot of, you know, we have some students on the line as well as some, uh, so hopefully some uh, folks in residency. Um, and we're going to be discussing some topics tonight that are really pertinent to anybody getting into practice or even maybe early into practice. Um, and this talk is going to be brought to you by a Dr. Adrian Ross, who's a, uh, who's a physician practicing in Conyers, Georgia. She's a New York College grad, 2008, um, currently on staff at the Decatur Hospital in Piedmont Rockdale Hospital in Georgia. Um, she's a graduate of the, the, the famed and notable West Penn program in Pittsburgh, uh, and also pursued a, a fellowship in trauma and reconstruction at the University of Louisville Hospital and Jewish Medical Center. Um, I had the privilege of uh, actually meeting her for the first time at the uh, State Advocacy Forum that the APMA hosted just a few weeks back, uh, also in Atlanta. Um, and she's very, very deeply engaged with the Georgia Podiatric Medical Association. So without any further ado, I will pass things over to Dr. Ross. Thank you. Thank you for that warm introduction. Well, I'm going to keep this pretty organic because if anyone has any questions, you know, throughout and um, I'll give my talk, but I'm going to give it a pretty much of a personal spin to it because I really want um, the young practitioners and the physicians on the line to really be able to relate um, and just they'll be able to, you'll be able to see the similarities in our stories. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Okay, and here we go. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, wonderful. All right, so I have been really passionate. I've worked with young physicians for a very long time. Um, but I, one thing that I did notice, and I talk with a lot of my students and a lot of my residents is, there doesn't seem to be a very healthy transition between going from you know, a graduate from either residency or a fellowship into, you know, being a young practitioner and knowing exactly what do I do from here? How am I going to be successful? How do I define success? Um, I know how to, I know how to do a flat foot reconstruction, but I don't necessarily know how to plan from this point forward. So that's what this talk is geared at more so is, you know, what are, how do you prioritize what's important? Um, and, uh, and a couple tips, quips, and pearls from me as to um, where do we go from here. So I'll give you a little bit of a background. Um, I'm basically going to talk a little on, you know, how do you practice for perfection? You know, kind of being that ongoing or perpetual learner that you often hear mentors will talk about. Um, boards is obviously a really common uh, topic amongst young practitioners because obviously that's that seems like the culmination of everything that we study for is you want to be able to pass your boards and. Um, you know, how do you pass your boards, everything around boards. Also, I'll talk about building your CV and how can you use your CV, your resume to, um, to build your professional network? How do you use it so that you can market yourself? Because essentially it's a marketing tool, okay? And, um, and how do you constantly grow your CV, evolve your CV, and so it's the best representation of who you are, you know, to podiatrists and also to non-podiatrists. Um, the value of speaking and publishing, I'm going to talk very passionately about that. My students um, typically will hear me say in the office that, you know, one of the only ways that you're going to really know if you know something is, is if you can be an authority on it. And one of the ways that you can know if you're an authority is you speak, you teach, you publish on it, you do labs on it. Um, and that's one of the ways that you really hone in on your skill set. And then lastly, how do you build and protect your livelihood? And that's where I'm going to give a little bit of my personal testimony to how did PICA play into this um, and and what exactly is PICA good for, to be honest with you. You know, I would just want to be able to get down to the raw, the raw nuts of it. So a little bit about me, some of you who know me and some of you who don't know me, this is this is a little bit more than just your typical physician. I'm a mother. I'm a wife. Um, I am a stained glass artist. That's something that is a passion of mine. I happen to be a martial artist. I've been doing Taekwondo or Taekwondo for ever since I was four years old. You know, it's kind of just something that has been, I've competed, I've done that for a very long time. 
I'm currently a board member of the Medical Advisory Committee for PICA. I am the president-elect and a board member for GPMA. Um, and I'm also a physician consultant for the Medical Compliance Associates, which is how I came to know PICA in a different light, and I'll expound on a little bit more later. I own my own practice, so I'm self-employed, which is another reason why I wanted to give this talk, because a lot of young practitioners and students have, have also told me that most of the physicians that they meet are, are actually not solo practitioners. And what are the nuances of that? And how do you, you know, can, do they still survive? Is, there, is it even possible? And of course, it's absolutely possible and you can do very, very well. Um, and then I'm also teaching faculty for a number of institutions and I'm very involved in my, um, my department with respect to Emory Decatur Hospital. So I'm sure everybody, anyone who's in medicine has heard this, this term work-life balance, which I think honestly is kind of a unicorn. It's more of work-life prioritizing, you know? So if you look at this picture that I have on the screen, it's more of a, okay, what stands out to you in bold? And then what kind of fades in the background? You know, and that's the way that I describe it. So it's funny, most of the, the medical students who have come through my office, I will usually tell them to write down five to seven different variables. They change off and on. But for the most part, these are the, the core five. Autonomy or your independence, family, income, location, and business. So my equation is I'll typically give them that list and I'll say, okay, go ahead and rank it from one to five. What is most important to you? Not saying that you don't value family, but what's most important to you and what's least important to you. And typically from the way that you rank that, I can give you a couple of pearls as to what's a better practice style that's gonna be suited for you. So for instance, someone who truly values autonomy and I wanna be able to determine when I'm gonna take my own vacations. I wanna determine if I'm gonna be able to run the office the way I want and have that independence and in, in, um, in decision-making. That's someone who's gonna be more geared to a small practice someone who's gonna be more geared to even solo practitioner, maybe not necessarily someone who works for a hospital. A hospital, you're not gonna get as much autonomy. On the flip side, someone who is interested in maybe a high salary and they don't wanna have anything to do with business. You know, and it's more important of, I just wanna make sure that I have the income, stable income. I don't wanna think about, it. I don't wanna be involved in any of the business aspect of it. I just wanna do, I just wanna be a doctor then that's more suited for a much larger practice um, and also a hospital-based uh, practice even. So just based off of that, that's what I'm kind of getting to is what are your priorities? And if you don't know yourself as a person, if you don't know yourself as a physician, then it's gonna be very difficult for you to plan for the future if you don't know exactly what you want. What are your goals? Um, so it, it's really interesting is because I've spent a lot of time, you know, looking through white coat investors. Some of us, you know, have read all the textbooks and we're enamored by it because, oh my gosh, there is, there's something else to medicine, you know, and there's other people, there's a network of people who actually understand that you come out with a lot of student loan debt, the majority of us, you know, and you're trying to figure out, okay, what exactly are my goals? Should I pay off my student loan debt first? Or, you know, should I go into the military service? Um, should I start my own practice? Should I work for a hospital? What should I do? And there's not a lot of guidance out there to be completely honest as to what you can do. So I'm using this talk more of a, let me open up your mind and say, okay, the way that I've geared it after talking to several people, and I can't even tell you how exhausted it's been, but I've talked to many people and learned their experiences. It's really important that you don't put all your eggs in one basket. So if you're a practitioner, like for me, I'm self-employed. I have income that comes from my own practice, but I also have about three other businesses that are unrelated to my practice. If anything were to ever happen to the medical practice, let's say something as simple as I go out on maternity leave. I'm not actively in my practice to make income. And let's say Blue Cross Blue Shield or one of the insurance carriers decides to hold up claims for whatever reason. And let's say it's my number one carrier. Okay, that those are true stories that can happen and that often do happen. Now, what are you gonna rely on? Okay, so the majority of the time we make panic decisions because we haven't properly prepared and we haven't been properly educated on what should we do as physicians in the business setting, not just in the medicine setting. We're really well informed in the medical side, but not so much on the business and life planning side of it. And so what I typically will tell people is that if you have three to four uh, streams or revenues of income, as you can see in my little diagrams here, and if you can have at least one of them be passive income, you're in a much better state, whether you can make smart 
uh, financial decisions in the future. So for instance, I, I remember speaking to a physician who owned a record label. I had no idea, owned his own record label, was signing artists. He had a business partner who managed all that. He was a very busy uh, surgeon. I mean, pretty amazing. You had no idea he had this kind of another life, okay? Very successful, all right? Um, and he had that other aspect. I met another physician who ended up buying a tropical smoothie cafe, okay? And he had someone manage that. And then there's there are a couple of physicians that I know in my network that they said, you know, I don't know anything about business. I don't have anyone in my family to guide me. But what I do like doing is I like investing. I just like the concept of it, but I don't know how to do it. So he got involved with four other physicians and they formed an investment group. He gave money into it. And to this day, I, I was just having a conversation with him the other day. And he said, it's actually done quite well, but he has someone manage it for him. Others have done Airbnb. There's a lot of other streams of income. Okay. But unfortunately, the way that we are, um, I want to say brought up in medicine is that you dedicate your entire life to medicine and that is all you do and it is very tunnel visioned and so i'm encouraging and i'm challenging the young practitioners on the call to really look at it from a different perspective because in the long term it's going to lead you to a lot less likely of burnout okay because you have other streams of income and other streams of interests so practice for perfection like i was saying so if you look at some of these pictures these are all my photos um, and I've chosen these photos because it shows the evolution in my interest as far as practicing. I realized early on when I got out um, that I really do love trauma, but I love reconstruction more. For whatever reason, that's my niche. You know, I enjoyed limb salvage, but I wanted to do what I considered almost like a true limb salvage. I wanted to do a muscle flap. I wanted to do peripheral nerve surgery for the woman who hasn't walked in six years. You know, I want to do difficult tendon transfers. So what did I have to do? After fellowship training, I had to go and I had to study. I had to research more. I went and sought out labs. You know, I was doing training at, at other institutions that weren't necessarily geared for podiatrists. Um, I remember going up to a mentor of mine and saying, um, well, how did you do that flap? And he said, well, you have to learn to crawl before you can walk. And I thought, all right, well, show me how to crawl. You know, just tell me what I need to do. And I basically, I just, I went all over the country just looking for these labs and what I could do to train myself. I was practicing for perfection. And why does that have anything to do with what I'm talking about here? These, you know, this toolkit for young practitioners is because we have embarked on a career where very much our foundation is built upon our intellect and our knowledge, you know, and our skill sets. So if you don't have a good toolbox and all your skill sets, if you're not good at what you do, it's going to be very difficult to build a foundation and build a strong house on that. When this is the career, this is our primary income, this is our primary craft, and it is your specialty. So you have to know it and you have to know it well, and you can't assume that your, your skill sets don't need to evolve with time. So like, as you can see in these pictures, the far right picture is a hemisolio flap. That's something that if you would have asked me 15 years ago, 10 years ago, I would have said, there's no way I'm going to do that. There's just, there's no way I'm not going to, I'm not going to open somebody's leg up and do a hemisolio flap, you know, but I did after training and, and patients did well. And I realized it was a whole new area that I had never explored. On the left, you can see that that is um, a peripheral nerve grafting for an aroma that I shorted out. So I didn't develop a stump neuroma, something again, that I never would have thought that I would be doing. But long story short, I took my top 25 surgical procedures, which is what I'm telling the young practitioners on the call to do. Take your top 25 procedures, procedures that work well in your hands, not procedures that work well in other people's hands that you're trying to force into your hands, but procedures that work well for you. I know that I do well with a lateral ankle stabilization and scoping. I can do that well. You know, I do that better than some other procedures, maybe even better than I do a bunion. Okay, but that's just my hands. All right. So you have to figure out what is it that works for you. And then you hone in on your skill set. And now we can start building the house. So if you can picture in your mind, I'm building a house. Here's my foundation. This one slide right here. What am I good at? And what will people know me for? How can I subspecialize? OK. Now, next, I want to start building the walls to this house. So I, I have to kind of climb the, the ranks in medical school, you know, allopathic, podiatric, osteopathic, it's all the same. You know, you basically keep pushing forward and climbing that ladder until you, you essentially can't go any further. Okay. And one of those steps in that ladder is board certification. 
So one thing that I notice is that every time that I ask young practitioners or even residents that are coming out and about to go for a board uh, qualification is, how do I study for it? How do I study? There's no general textbook for it. You know, when you look up on the board's exams, you know, on the websites, they usually give you a long exhaustive list of every single textbook that's cited, you know, for foot and ankle surgery, but it doesn't really help you that much. You know, and most people, they don't do that much research into it to figure out, okay, what do I need to know? I'm giving you an example, but there is a, a Pearl's book called by Richard J called Pearls of the Foot and the Ankle. It trains you and because it presents cases, I think over 55 cases, all right, of how to think that you are a problem solver naturally. So when you're pursuing boards as a young practitioner, you need to prepare not just for the medical side of it, you need to also prepare for, I'm taking a standardized exam. What is it that they want me to learn? Because there's always a goal. You can always narrow it down to two answers for the most part, but you want to know what is it that they want me to take home from this. So you have to read the rules and you have to play by their rules. So for instance, you know, when you go for case reviews for, um, you know, for AB, ABPS or ABPM or whatnot, you have to sit and look and realize that you shouldn't be making addendums, you know, to any of your medical records when you go for, for uh, case submissions. A lot of people didn't know that, so they'll fail, fail their boards. If you go and you look on the websites, it'll go through the grading of the cases and what they will dock you for, or when you actually take the, multi, the multiple choice portion that you can actually skip ahead a couple of slides and you can actually learn, okay, what is it that the, the, uh, the, the pearls that they're gonna give you? They're gonna give you x-rays that show you a little bit more, then you go back. So my whole point for saying this is that when you take the boards, it's not just another test. You have to try to figure out what is it that they want you to take from it? What do they want you to know? And then lastly, when, with respect to the boards is, you know, certain hospitals have a required number of years for you to be certified. A lot of physicians don't know that. And you don't realize until you've already been out three to four years and you're thinking, okay, now I should go ahead and start really honing in on trying to get these cases for doing my board certification. And you may be down to maybe one or two years. There's only so many times you can take it, you know, in a year. Okay, so that's really important. Um, and I spoke to a practitioner, I can't remember where she was from, where, you know, just the insurance companies now are starting to say you have to have be board certified in a certain number of years. And some hospitals require a specific boards that they will only accept. If you don't know that ahead of time, you're going to be in trouble. So typically what I tell my young practitioners when they're coming out is look for all the hospitals in your area and ask when you call their offices, they'll tell you how long do you require for board certification and what boards do you accept? And then you will be a step ahead of the game. Building your CV. So when I was at West Penn in residency, um, I had the privilege, Dr. Katanzariti, um, I remember coming to me and saying, you know what? I want you to go ahead and I want you to go and bring these speakers in. When these speakers come in, we had our own forum, almost kind of like the Podiatry Institute does, where you know multiple speakers will come in and you have your own mini conference. And we had the same thing at West Penn. And he said, I want you to introduce these speakers. So I want you to pick them up, read their resumes. So I ended up collecting every single one of their resumes. Imagine me as a, you know, I think it was a second year or first year resident. And I've got a stack of, you know, Jordan Grossman's resume. I've got Chris Addinger's resume. I've got all of these guys, these really, really amazing people. And I started comparing them. And so basically I created my resume off of everything good that I saw of those 20 to 30 resumes that I saw over the years, okay? And this is what I came up with. As a young practitioner, you never, ever, ever take your resume off the network. So my resume is always circulating out there, you know, whether it's my, uh, my orthopedic um, job recruiters or anybody. I always send my resume out there. It's always floating around. Even though I own my own practice and the likelihood of me taking another job, is probably I'm not going to. I'm not going to walk away from my practice. However, you always keep that opportunity out there because you want to know what's there. And then the other aspect of it is um, your resume is something that's constantly evolving. So if you look at my resume, and I've actually put the first two pages of my, I have a four-page resume, but I have, I think, six, six versions of my resume, okay? So one version may say that I'm a certified professional coder. One of them won't even mention it, Okay. This resume in particular is the one that I typically refer for my students, my residents, as well as other young practitioners that I'll talk to, is I, I put a quote in there right underneath my name of someone notable, preferably, 
depending who I'm actually sending it to, from a letter of recommendation that I got from them, a quote that speaks of me so that the first time that they look at the resume, they know that this is different than any other resume they've seen. And automatically they're trying to get to the point of, oh, this is someone who I need to pay attention to. Then underneath it, I go into a little bit of personal. For me, I speak Spanish and Mandarin and English, obviously. So I put that there so that they can see that I speak more than one language. It makes me marketable, okay? Because it's a marketing tool. I go down to fellowship training because I've actually done a fellowship. Who did I train with? If I was interviewing at an orthopedic practice, guess what? They would recognize the name David Seligson because he's one of the top trauma surgeons you know, for orthopedics. He's more published than, than hardly anyone that I know, and he's a Harvard grad. Um, the Dr. Hockenberry, who also made the quote, is a descendant of or disciple of Samarco, you know, a foot and ankle orthopedist. You know, uh, Sherry Gabriel is a pediatric orthopedist. So there, it's a strategy to it, why I pick it. Um, if I'm going to a multi-specialty practice that I'm interviewing for, I, I bold those names, okay? When I look down for residency training, you know, obviously everybody knows West Penn, you know, so I make sure I put that there, but I also include some of the non-podiatric physicians that I worked with that are also big names, you know, because the whole idea is I'm showing, I'm, I'm, I'm broadcasting without sending a 20 page dissertation that, hey, I've got really good training in the podiatric realm as well as the non-podiatric realm. So I identify people who are well known such as the plastic surgeons, you know, Dr. White, Dr. Heckler, you know, who are really well known. So that if I were to look at a practice or a hospital that they would be able to say, hey, I think I may know that person, okay? When I go into my professional appointments, I keep it current. So you're not gonna see anything from 2005 as my last, you know, my last professional appointment. I wanna show that I'm constantly involved. And, you know, with, the, with your CV, with your resume, you know, for me, it's something that's constantly evolving. So, you know, you know, in the beginning, when you're a student, it'll look a lot like fluff. You know, you're involved in an art class. You know, you're involved in, you know, you did a fitting camp or something to that effect. And slowly you will replace those and you'll put more meat into your resume. But the idea is to show that you are a diverse professional um, and that you're very well-rounded and you're very skilled and very educated at what you do. The rest of my resume just talks about all of my publications, my poster presentations, everything that I've done. Um, but I, like I said, I have six different versions. So I try to tell my young practitioners, your resume truly is your marketing tool. Now, how do you build your professional network? So a lot of times when people think your professional network is really just catering more to the podiatrist, it's not, it really isn't. And it's not just to get referrals from people. Your professional network is also going to include anybody in your local area. So when I say local podiatrist, I'm also speaking of a podiatrist who may say, you know what, I don't necessarily want to do a flap. I don't want to fix that ankle fracture. I don't want to do that. That's just not something I'm interested in. So I want to know someone who's competent, who can take care of my patients that I can refer to. So you want to make sure that you're reaching out to your local podiatrist you know, within 20 to 25 mile radius and sometimes even further to see if that's something that you can be that person for them, whatever your subspecialty might be. Um, when it comes to residency and fellowships, I've been involved in three different residencies, you know, uh, one fellowship, you know, and I've been involved in a lot of the committees and helping with a lot of the decision-making process. Now, why? Because I'll be honest with you, the more that you surround yourself with young practitioners and young thinkers, the more you will be enlightened. And also just contributing back to the profession is not something that goes one way. It actually goes back to you as well. Um, and on a side note, if you can ever have an opportunity to teach, that also makes your resume look much, much better because you are giving back. Um, and they you know, teaching institutions typically have to stay pretty current on their, on their research as well. So that's something that's different. And that's the reason why that I, one of the reasons why I do it. Hospital committees. So I don't know if you noticed on my resume, you know, I, I currently sit as vice chair for the department um, of podiatry uh, for Emory. It used to be DeKalb Medical and now it's Emory. Did I join it because I have no time, I have nothing to do and I just wanted to be on another committee? No. Not at all. I have many things to do and I have enough on my plate. But to be honest with you, why? It's because I wanna be involved in almost every single decision that is made. I wanna also be involved in if there's a way that we can communicate and showcase our profession to allied health specialties, I wanna be at the forefront of that. I wanna make sure that we have a face um, 
that that represents us well. So I want to be involved in that. And if there's anything that's going to come against podiatry, I want to make sure that I'm actively involved in that. So that is one of the reasons why you get involved in your state advocacy, you get involved in hospital committees, that you are doing something active as a young practitioner is because the general idea is that young practitioners don't care. All you care about or all we care about are passing our boards and making sure we get a good job and we make a lot of money. And that's not the case. That's not the case at all. So a lot of times that's that's where we need to start is we need to show up and show that we are active and that we can do more um, than what we, um, we've been coined for. Um, on another note as well, um, and I'm gonna get into this a little bit more later, but when building your professional network, podiatry is a very small profession, but also foot and ankle surgery, including the foot and ankle orthopedist is also a small profession, okay? So collaborating and, and having a good relationship with your local orthopedist, podiatrists, your, your family medicine physicians, um, your endocrinologists, infectious disease. I'm on speed dial for a lot of them at the hospital because we do each other favors. You know, if they need help with something, and even if you don't necessarily need to be consulted, you help them out. And the idea also is that, hey, if we can collaborate and we can do a paper together, or if we can do research together, that's going to strengthen us both in the long run, okay, and provide a better, um, a better uh, outlet of care for our patients. So many ways of doing that. So much like what I was saying just a minute ago, why should you speak? Why do you even publish? You know, I, I came from and I'm involved in programs right now that there is a lot of publishing, a lot of publications coming out. There's a lot of opportunity to speak. The reason why is because you wanna be an authority in your field, okay? The moment that you publish in a peer reviewed journal, you are considered an expert in your field by definition, okay? I remember I was trying to get privileges at a hospital. I won't say which one, um, but there was a hospital that I was going for privileges in here in Georgia. And there weren't many podiatrists that were on staff and uh, there was an orthopedist that was actually the chief of the department. And I had been certified in total ankle uh, implants, a total ankle um, um, surgery and had my certification and everything to that effect. I had done them in residency, done them in fellowship and I felt confident in doing them, specifically that particular type, that implant. And when I submitted for my privileges, that physician said no was completely unwilling to, to give me those privileges. Even if I supplied the case, I supplied the cases, there were plenty of cases, still said no. So what I did was I went back and I printed off an article that I had published with one of the ortho trauma doctors, you know, published in you know, a peer reviewed journal. I sent a couple of publications and I sent a nice little letter and said, I have published with one of your colleagues. I have no issue with getting one, of, one or both of them, your orthopedic colleagues on the phone to vouch for my skill set. If there are any issues, please let me know. And then all of a sudden I got a phone call that you've been approved for your privileges. And I had no pushback then. My whole point for that story is that you really, really need to network and you also need to publish because it is very difficult to challenge someone who says that they do cases, but they've also published on it and they've spoke on it, okay? So from a young practitioner's perspective, it seems like it's a waste of your time when in actuality it's not. And you become a quick leader in the profession. Okay, to the podiatric community as well as the non-podiatric community. Um, when you publish and you speak, you also create opportunities for consulting. And that's one of the other revenues that I usually encourage um, young practitioners to do is create your own consulting firm. Okay, you can do anything from consulting from insurance companies to consulting for malpractice uh, companies to doing your own consulting for even um, um, uh, third parties. Okay, so there's a lot of opportunities. Everybody's looking for a physician, but you just don't know because we're never educated as to what are the other areas that we can that we can generate revenue that wouldn't violate our contract. Um, so it really does create other opportunities for streams of revenue. So you're not solely dependent on your job or your employer. Okay, and the idea is that you would you would be speaking on a specific subject. So you're a subject matter expert or an SME, as my husband would say, you know, within the Deloitte and the consulting world. Okay, and that's the goal is that you would pick something. So if you are into dermatology or if you wanna speak on bone tumors or pediatrics or sports medicine, the beautiful thing about podiatry is that we truly can, I mean, you can do trauma like, like Gooman did. You can do anything that you want. So there's really nothing that you can limit yourself on. Um, it really does just come down to, are you bold enough to go and speak on it and to fine tune your skill set so that you are an authority on it? 
Now, how do you build and protect your livelihood? And remember, I was I gave you that imagery of a house. OK, so we've got all of these different walls going up. The foundation is that education, your skill set that now at this point, you've already honed in and you've done well. You're continuing to build up your, 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 your armamentarium with your skills, your walls. You've got your practice or your job, your primary income. Now you have a, you've got these other three uh, streams of income. So it could be, let's say, you know, you, you've got your consulting firm, which is very easy. Setting up an LLC is very, very easy. OK. On the other aspect, let's say that you decide to invest in real estate, okay? And the next is something else. But the idea is that you've got at least four streams of income, all right? And so you've got the walls to this house now that if one falls, you're not going to go bankrupt. You're not going to, your family's not going to go hungry, okay? And then the foundation, the roof, excuse me, the roof of it is going to be essentially you're topping all that off, Right? So you're, now you're gonna go a little bit further into depth into your education. You're gonna say, okay, now how do I market myself? How am I able to stick myself out there and rebrand myself? So this is what I do. I can do all of these things, okay? And then now you're coming to a point, you're realizing um, what is it that, that is the most important for me of all of these streams of, of revenue, of all of these interests that I have, you know, what is most important for me and what am I gonna concentrate most of my energy on? And then the fence that you can see going around that lovely house is your malpractice insurance, okay? Now, I'll speak to this because I have, a, I have an interesting story. And a lot of people don't know my tale. Um, and I'll try to say it as, um, as eloquently as I can. Um, but sometimes we plan things and sometimes we fall into things. You know, a lot of people like to say that they've planned everything, but we're just being, you know, we're lacking humility in that. We really do have many accidents that happen. And some are good accidents and some aren't. Um, a good accident happened to me when I was, I was in a practice once before and ran into some issues, you know, and long story short, I was recruited, you know, by a firm to do some medical legal consulting. You know, they asked me, they said, you know, you, your resume is pretty, pretty significant. I remember we've worked on that resume all this time. Your resume is pretty, I mean, pretty substantial for somebody who's so young. I remember an actual uh, attorney telling me this. And he said, would you be interested in doing, you know, some expert testimony in the future? And I said, sure, I had no idea. You know, I was like, I, I'm not sure exactly what this is. So I went and read a, you know, a bunch of books on how do you do an expert testimony? How do you write expert reports? Right. And, and so I got a phone call when I left that practice and to start my own and asking me, hey, would you be interested in joining us? And I said, you know, I'm not quite sure what exactly I'll be doing. They said, we just want you to basically speak on what you know best medicine. And I said, well, yeah, I can do that. That's, that sounds easy. Sure. And so that was six, seven years ago or so. And I've been working with them ever since. And that at that time, I was not very involved with PICA from, you know, working on an advisory board role, but I saw the other side of PICA, which most people don't know. Most young practitioners came out and a lot of physicians come out and think that PICA, you know, that little fence around you is almost an invisible fence. We don't realize how much PICA actually does for us. And so that's why I wanted to tell kind of almost my personal testimony or my story as to what did PICA do for me and but what was I able to do also for the constituents of PICA? Okay, so before I get to that, so um, like I told you with that story. So I remember I was presented with a case that the case at the time I wanna say was $2.1 million of an overpayment. The, um, which is pretty typical, the cases that I'm doing. $2.1 million, an insurance company was asking a physician to pay back. Now, obviously most of us don't walk around with $2.1 million. Even if you've been paid it over the course of eight to 10 years, you're not holding it in the bank somewhere, right? So they were asking for this money back because they didn't agree with the way that these codes were being billed. It wasn't fraud. They called it overuse and abuse or whatnot. And I remember the consultants and the attorney came to me and said, hey, can you review this case and tell me what you think? I looked at the case and I said, you know, this physician is not a bad player. You know, he's genuinely not trying to, you know, to, to rip off the entire insurance company. Genuinely looking at it, it's just poor education. The physician had no idea what the rules were for that particular insurance carrier. He didn't know what we call LCDs or local coverage determinations. You know, what are those rules? So for instance, let's say in Florida, you can't bill a skin substitute unless you meet certain criteria. You have to document four weeks, let's say, of conservative treatment before you put it on. We're never trained that in medical school, you know, which is one of the reasons why I have such a passion for this talk. So through that experience, I was able to talk to the doctor, to counsel, to help defend the doctor 
you know, based off of the documentation and educate him as well on what he can and can't do. And we ended up, to be honest with you, we won. He, we won in my in my terms because he did not have to pay two point one million dollars back. He ended up paying actually, I want to say it was less than ten thousand dollars back, which is a drop in the bucket. And there are so many cases like that. That was a PICA case. So many of these cases that we've done that people just do not hear about. You know, I had a graduate from my residency program, um, the one that I, I, the residency program that I'm at currently and I'm training, a graduate that came up on my radar who the practice that he was in, same thing, you know, ended up owing over $400,000, you know, and it happens all the time. And I looked at the names and I thought, okay, this is someone that, you know, I've seen in the operating room. I helped train them on, I'm, you know, podiatry is a small profession. You know, there was another time it was one of my old professors that I got a chance and I was working on the case. You know, so all that to say that there is a lot that the young practitioner does not know. And when it comes to PICA, there are a lot of battles that are being fought. So unfortunately, when you have all of these different insurance carriers, what you see is, oh, well, this one charges me this amount of money. Well, this one's cheaper. When in actuality, would you pay $5 for something that's really cheap? Let's say a cheap dress that you know is gonna split you know, the hem's going to come out, everything's just going to fall apart. Or would you pay $50 for something you know is going to last for the next five years or so? And that's what it comes down to. So I wanted to give the young practitioners specifically, because I keep running into this, that PICA has been fighting battles for a long time with normal things, not fraud, not these big, crazy cases, but the normal audits that happen on a day-to-day -day basis that any other insurance carrier typically will just drop you or they'll just say, go ahead and pay the $2.1 million. It was your fault, you know, but because I've had the inside view of seeing this, um, you want to make sure that your fence around the house is a true fence and not an invisible line. So documentation matters. So getting back to like what I was saying, you know, PICA and you know, these carriers cannot defend you, but specifically PICA cannot defend you if you don't have your documentation in order. There is meaningful documentation and then there is worthless documentation. You know, when you clone your notes just repeatedly over and over so much to the point where you're saying that CFT times 10 and the patient had two, amp you know, two digital amputations that, that might not work so well, you know, when it's under an audit. But what I will tell you is that for the young practitioner, this is what I want you to focus on because I'm giving you a lot of information, okay? If there's nothing else you remember, when you document in your chart for that note, I want you to remember two words, treatment rationale. Why are you doing this? I want you to put a little paragraph at the end of your note. You've got somebody who's been coming to you for an ulcer, okay? It looks off to you. You wanna schedule them for surgery, just something seems off. Put it in your treatment rationale in your medical note. Explain what your thought process is. Well, the patient has only been to me for two weeks. However, the patient has seen five other physicians and has had this wound uh, opening and closing off and on. Anyone else, any clinician knows that you've got to rule out osteo, a wound that keeps closing and opening. It's a draining sinus, right? If you don't explain that, an insurance carrier is automatically going to say, well, no, why did you put the skin substitute on for this patient? Or why did you decide to take them to surgery without you know, exhausting all conservative measures, okay? You have to explain what you're thinking. And the majority of the time, I can be honest with you, that's what wins the case. So treatment rationale. When you're building templates, because everyone uses templates and procedures, look up and see. If you're in Florida, look up and see what are the LCDs in your state for the procedure. Sometimes there isn't an LCD or a local coverage determination or a rule okay, that we have not been taught in medical school, and I certainly know not in residency. Look up to see what are the LCDs in your state, because if you see what the recommendations are, you can actually build them into your template, and guess what? You're automatically compliant. Okay, so that's something that um, I wish and I'm hoping talks like this, we can actually teach our young practitioners more so, so we don't run into issues in the future. Also, so when it comes to the history of the pre present illness, when you go to operative reports, when you do a surgical procedure, right up above before you get to surgery and you even start your note, put in the history of the present illness. Patient has been with me for six months. You know, patient has exhausted all conservative treatment. You know, patient uh, states that this has been painful even with normal daily activities. You have to give the rationale, the reasoning why you're taking them to surgery. That's very important. It can strengthen the case. And then lastly here, um, before we get to the next page is, what is everything that's failed? 
you know, if you look at AFO bracing, they're getting very stringent on their guidelines, you know, with surgeries and skin substitutes. It's okay, you've tried all these different things, but what's actually failed, okay, before you go to that big ticket item that they don't really want to pay for. OK, so when we get out and when we get out of residency or fellowship, a lot of young practitioners, the vendors seem to know. I mean, they hone in on us. Right. They want to ask us. They want to ask us to try all of these really exotic surgeries or use these products that are really expensive that they guarantee you you'll be paid for. OK, when in actuality, they're not telling you what's the documentation that you need to get it paid for. So all the failed conservative treatment. OK, so just remember that part. Um, furthermore, so consent forms, how do you write a consent? How do you assess the pain? Um, if there's anything I can tell you and something that one of my mentors when I was being trained told me is you need to document normal daily activities. So if this patient normally goes for a one mile walk with their dog and now they can't, you want to put that in the note. Patient is unable to do a normal daily activity, which includes going for a walk with her dog for one mile. If the patient normally doesn't run a marathon and they're saying now they can't run a marathon, I'd say, well, then that's not a normal daily activity for you. That's not really gonna change my decision-making. But if it's something that they normally do, yes, because now that's affecting their quality of life. And that's what you wanna paint that picture of. Um, when it comes down to pain assessment, um, and I'll, I'll broaden this out a little bit as I'm getting ready to wrap up this talk. Uh, what's most important is that when you're assessing anything objective on your physical exam or within the pain or the HPI, take it down to an objective scale. So whether if it's pain, you want a VAS scale or a one to 10, you know, anything to that effect so that you can standardize it. The idea is that you standardize your treatment. That's what I have to say that the orthopedists do very well. If you're evaluating somebody with chronic lateral ankle instability, you better put an anterior drawer test or a tailored tilt uh, exam in there. Something that can standardize it so you can substantiate that there is a, a need to do a procedure. So like I said, the pica behind the scenes of what I was talking about, and I'll, I'll give you a little bit more of my story. So now that you've seen, I've done the medical consulting work for this firm. I've been working with pica. We're fighting for these clients. We're winning cases. We're doing well. You know, these clients are calling me saying, hey, I can't believe I don't have to pay that money. You know, and sometimes these insurance companies are actually issuing them a refund of how much that they're apologizing. Okay. After doing that, I was invited to join the PICA advisory board, you know, and I thought I'm involved in so many different things. Do I really want to do this, to be honest with you? You know, I don't really need any more on my resume. Um, but the thing that won me over, that I've seen PICA fight for clients when I've seen other malpractice carriers, and I won't mention names, have literally dropped people, literally dropped people. And I can only obviously go from my experience, but that's what I'm sharing with you because nobody really tells their story when it comes to PICA. We just assume that PICA is supposed to take care of us and that they're doing something in the back scenes and it's just, it's a lot of money and I don't, I don't want to pay that money when in actuality it's not. So for me, I'll tell you that ever since I've been working with PICA now on the advisory board side, um, I bring a different aspect of it because most of the physicians on the board haven't seen and done what I've done and haven't gone before ALJs, haven't been at these hearings, haven't spoken to a physician who says, you know, I'm gonna lose everything, aren't I? And we're going to bat for them. You know, they're not losing their house. They're not having to, to go ahead and give up the thing that they love the most. You know, so I'm telling you right now as a young practitioner that there, are, there is a lot more behind the scenes and do not be enamored by a lower price or by something that's easier when you're going to work for a practice and they say, oh, you don't really need to have, you know, a really good malpractice carrier. It's just everybody gets malpractice. They're lying to you. So make smart decisions um, first and foremost. So, so in summary, I know I've said a lot, but these are the take home points. Okay. Be good at your craft. Know what you do and do it well. Study it, study it to a T so that anybody who encounters you knows that you know what you're doing. Okay. When it comes to boards, don't approach the boards as any other exam. Try to figure out from their perspective, is this something, what, what do they want me to know? I want my certification, so I'm gonna go after my certification aggressively and quickly and make sure that I'm methodical about every case that I choose. I'm gonna treat and build my resume as if it is my calling card, as if my resume truly is my marketing tool. It's my little business card, okay? I'm gonna put things on my resume and I'm gonna have multiple versions of it is because my resume is what I'm gonna to offer to attorneys and to anyone else who really wants someone who knows what they're talking about so I can build up that other brand that's not just within my primary profession, my primary um, um, uh, job. Building your professional network. When you do it, remember that 
you know, kind of almost like what the Bible says, you're surrounded, surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. Remember that everybody's watching you, you know, so that professional network that you have truly is important. So the podiatrist and the non-podiatrist make friends with everyone, because when you want to co-author a paper, you know, with an orthopedist or a plastic surgeon, um, that's going to speak volumes, speak volumes when you want to speak at a conference or you want to get, get on staff at a, at a hospital and they don't necessarily know what we can do. It speaks volumes. Publishing and speaking, like I said, and lastly, how do you protect your livelihood? How do you, how do you protect your, your house that you've spent so much time building? How do you do that? Is by educating yourself on the business side of it, educating yourself on you know, the, the rules of the game, the insurance companies are playing by that you were not taught, okay? Educating yourself and just knowing that they're out there. And also putting a really nice fence around you called your malpractice insurance that is going to bat for you even when you're sleeping, even when you don't even realize it, okay? And lastly, make sure that you know yourself and you know what you want and what are your priorities? Because in the long run, if you don't know what you want, then you don't know where you're going in the future. And I'd like to open it up for questions at this point. You know, it's kind of a little bit of a longer talk, but obviously I'm pretty passionate about it. So if anyone has questions, I would really, really love to hear that now. And we can talk pretty organically. Dr. Ross, before I think uh, if anyone has any questions, we can bring them up in a minute. In a minute, I just wanted to actually make a point that um, I, I really appreciate a lot of the things that you discussed during this talk. I mean, there are so many, so many discussions that are had with young practitioners at, at different conferences that we go to and in different webinars that they, they have a tendency to remain more superficial and they don't really get into the heart of a lot of the things that, that young practitioners should be thinking about. And in 47 minutes, you hit home on some really critical topics that I think everybody on this call can, can take to heart and, and find value in. And for that, we really appreciate your time today to, to discuss some of this, because even, even me, I'm, I'm several years into practice and I'm a, a you know, private practice owner with my wife. Sure. And, and some of the things you discussed are, are really, they're, they're rather eye-opening. So um, yeah. I do thank you for your time for sure this evening. Absolutely, thank you. Do we have any questions, anybody on the call, either through the chat or um, you can also feel free just to speak out loud or via video, bring up a question for Dr. Ross. Sure. I see a couple of names on the call too that I recognize. <laughs> As do I. Yep. <laughs> Well, let, let me pose a question out there, um, and I won't call on names, but, you know, is for the young practitioners specifically, is, or for anyone on the call, what are, what are some of the concerns that you have as a young practitioner? What, where do you feel like you're not prepared? You know, obviously you've been trained surgically, you've been trained, you know, in, the me in medicine, but what do you feel like you're not um, comfortable with or that you would like to know more about? Hi, this is Jimmy Watkins um, down at Oak Hill. Um, I feel kind of lost. I think you hit on it going over um, insurance, kind of navigating insurances, especially in a practice. It's like mm. I go to a practice, I go, let's say I go with my, the orthopedic surgeon I'm here and he's got like five different insurances that come to this place. Mm. Every single one of them have a new, like a different policy on what to do it's like how do you go about that like it's like because it's like i'll go see a patient and all of a sudden i'll like recommend something and he's like yeah but we can't do that for them i'm like wait all right so yeah. what do we do <laughs> like, um so i'm like how do you navigate that really just That's so you don't question. get this <laughs> you know what i mean like how do you yeah. do you just all of a sudden you open up a practice and you're like oh i want to take this insurance i want to take this insurance and yeah so, so how do you navigate that? Oh gosh, that's a great question. I'm so glad you opened with that. That's perfect. So you know it's funny when I when I started my practice, you know, again, solo practitioner, it, it really doesn't matter how much surgeries you're doing, it doesn't really matter what you're doing. You know, it really does matter on what the insurance company approves of um, and in what type of practice setting. So for instance, I can answer that question twofold. So when I started my practice, um, I had the luxury of being in a group practice beforehand. And I remember talking to the owner and I said, you know, 
how do we, what determines how much we get paid opposed to maybe another practitioner? And he told me, he said, well, we're a part of the, the PHO. And I said, what's a PHO? And he said, a physician health organization which I had never heard of the term. So what did I do? I called the DeKalb PHO and I said, what is a PHO? And so what she told me was that in certain areas, and a lot of physicians don't know this, there is a physician health organization or a preferred network. So what they basically tell the, the insurance companies is, hey, our physicians are special, you know, so you need to pay them more money than you would pay an average practitioner or a solo practitioner, you need to pay them more money. It's because we've had them do BMI checks. We've had them check, you know, medicines. We have all of these EG codes, everything, you know, and we randomly audit their charts, whatever the qualification may be. And you pay dues to be involved in this and usually only quarterly and it, it pans out. Um, so joining that PHO, when I, when I um, joined, when I started my own private practice, I thought, okay, well, I'm going to compare rates. You know, so I was treating a lot of the people that were at the DeKalb PHO, you know, so I had access to some of that. And then I compared against, you know, Piedmont Clinic, which I'm a part of right now. And Piedmont Clinic had a lot higher rates in certain areas. And so what I did was I looked and I saw that, okay, I, as a solo practitioner, if I try to start my own practice cold without being a part of a PHO, guess what? I'm not going to get paid anything, anything at all. It doesn't matter what insurances I accept. And so I joined a PHO. So that's the first part of the question is, okay, how do you maximize with no matter which insurance you're with, how much you're going to get as far as reimbursement? How do you maximize that? And one answer is a PHO. Two, getting to your question is, how do you know what you can do with certain insurance companies? Well, across the board, anything that is Medicare, Medicare, a lot of them try to mimic Medicare, you know, or they have Medicare-like plans, essentially. Medicare is kind of the mother of all of them, and they pay the least amount for the most part, with an exception to Medicaid, okay? Medicare will cover 80%, typically, you know, and they leave the last 20% or whatnot, you know, for AFO braces, anything to that effect. But Medicare is funny in the sense that they do not like anything experimental. Medicare doesn't like to pay for multiple procedures, okay? And your documentation really has to be up to par, okay? So with Medicare, that's what you base your practice on, okay? So anytime you start a practice, anytime you come out, you don't base it off of Aetna or Blue Cross Blue Shield or your higher payers. You base it off of Medicare because they're going to be your lowest payer essentially. And then you know that if your, your overhead, everything is based on that, then you'll always do more, okay? Now, again, getting back to your question is, now how do you know which insurance? You're not going to know every single one of them. It's about getting the right people on the bus. You're going to learn trends, but it's about getting the right people on the bus. For me, I went and recruited a practice manager from an orthopedic, excuse me, from a general um, surgery practice. And I told her, I said, you know, teach me what you've learned in 10 years. You know, I'm a certified professional coder, you know, but trying to keep up with these insurance companies is a little bit difficult. And she said, well, what I do is I go get the fee schedule. So that's one. You need to know the fee schedule. Every year, there's a fee schedule that's printed out from Medicare or whatnot. You make yourself a spreadsheet or you have the billing person show you that. You look at the fee schedule, you pick your top 25 CPT codes, and you see what those reimbursement numbers are. And that also tells you how you would set your pricing, okay? So that's one. Two is that person that you have that comes in, like my practice manager, she runs all the money in the practice so that I can be a doctor, but I learn from her because you never ever rely on one person in your practice to know everything, especially when it comes to the money. OK, so what I would tell you is in that practice that you're in right now, there's one person who knows everything. The doctors, we typically learn the trends. So I know for a fact, if I see a if I see a Blue Cross Blue Shield patient, which is my number one carrier, you try to learn your top carriers. So for me, my number one carrier is Blue Cross Blue Shield. I'm not going to learn all of the individual little plans. It's just impossible. But let's say 60 percent of my patients come from Blue Cross Blue Shield. I know for a fact that if I want to do a casting for L3020 for orthotics or for bracing, or if I want to give a cam boot, anything like that, that they're going to pay for it so long as, you know, it's under $450. If it doesn't go over $450 or $400, then I should be okay. Anything over that, it's going to be deductible. All right. That's what my, that's what my practice manager has taught me. So what you do is you pick your top three carriers, okay, that constitute the majority of your revenue and you ask them, okay, these are the key questions. You find the CPT codes you do the most, and then you figure out what the trends are. And it's always, it's for the most part, it stays that way. 
but the little bitty carriers you're not gonna know. So that's what the orthopedist has done in your practice is he knows the general trends, but you have one person in the practice, either your biller or your practice manager who knows the nuances of what needs to be done. And then on the side end of that is my practice manager every night before the next set of patients comes in, checks every insurance, every single one of them beforehand. And she has specific codes. So whether it's L3020 that she's checked and she leaves notes so that it's foolproof. Even if she's not in the office, the front office person will look at the notes and it'll say, collect this amount of money. If the patient wants this DME, this is how much you'll collect. So she's proof the list and she does it almost a week to two weeks in advance. Okay, so for running your own practice, that's what helps with collections um, and also for you to understand. I hope that answers your question. That was great. Thank you so much. That actually hit it on the nail. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Let's see a couple questions in the chat box. All right. So mostly billing. I try to attend as many coding lectures with something new comes up. Absolutely. Absolutely. So billing, billing comes up a lot. And the reason why is because we're not trained to bill. You know, we're never taught in medical school anything about what's the right codes. And I'll be honest with you, I've seen people give talks, billing lectures um, that frankly should not be giving billing talks. OK, my rule of thumb, to be honest with you, the only people who should really be giving you coding advice are people who are actually certified professional coders. All right. So that with that disclaimer being said, um, if you want to learn more about billing, um, APMA has a coding line. That's a really good tool, a really good tool. There's also something like I was mentioning on the last call is you really want to know what are your top codes that you're billing. OK, if you can isolate your top 25 codes and most of us, you know, I do a lot of casting, you know, um, I do a lot of AFO. I do a lot of procedures, injections. That's what you want to do. Write down those top CPT codes and you want to look up the LCDs for them because that's going to determine your billing. And also if you get paid, if there are any cross what we call CCI edits, which basically means, hey, I can bill nails, but I can't bill calluses with it or something to that effect. OK, if you learn those. And then your most important modifiers, you know, your 25 modifier, your 59, your 24, 78, 79. If you learn those top modifiers, then it's not going to feel so overwhelming, but you have to take it in bite sizes. Okay. So when you go to these billing and these coding seminars, don't be enamored so much by, you know, um, everybody's doing, you know, uh, ultrasound, you know, billing or whatnot, or the CPT code. Don't be enamored so much by that. Get down to, okay, what is it that I'm going to do in my practice? I'm going to do a 20605 injection code. Now I'm going to look up and see, is there a rule in my state that says that I need to do something specific for that? Okay. Now, how much do I, how much am I going to get reimbursed for it? Okay. I have a spreadsheet that actually says Blue Cross Blue Shield, Medicare, Aetna. And whenever I look at an EOB, I only do it every once in a while, but I'll compare and I'll look up and see how much they pay me for it because sometimes they'll underpay me. So when it comes, billing is such a big topic, but you have to make it smaller so that we can understand it because billing, to be honest with you, and I've done the CPC courses, to be honest with you, it doesn't make you that much more uh, proficient in it, I'll be honest. Okay, all it basically shows you is you need to have a CPT manual in your, in your office and an ICD-10 manual. OK, and whenever you're billing, you need to bill as specifically as possible. If it ends in a nine, most likely it's going to get kicked back. OK, it needs to end in a one or a two is because that specifies which extremity. OK, so but I can go into a little bit more of that later, but don't be intimidated by billing. Just make it bite sized. And I see a question from Kubra saying, as a third year resident, mostly billing insurance and legal aspects. Exactly. So billing. Insurance, I think I covered. From the legal aspects of it, um, it's documentation. You know, you can over document and you can under document. Um, but typically these days, people think that over documenting is going to save you and it doesn't. And in fact, it kind of hangs you out to dry, you know, from, from the defense perspective. So what you want to document in there is if you're going to put a graft on someone, um, you want to make sure they have pulses. OK, you want to make sure they have good and if they don't have pulses, then I hope you Doppler or you refer them over to vascular surgery. OK, so think about it more from a treatment rationale. If you had to put it into a paragraph and explain to someone over the telephone, why are you doing this? I kid you not, your notes are going to come out very nicely every single time. I don't care how it's organized. I don't care how pretty or what EMR system you use. Your rationale has to be consistent each time. It has to make sense. 
So we are right at the very bottom of the hour, Dr. Ross. I don't know if you have any other questions that have come through, uh, if there's anything else pending, or if anybody has any last minute short questions they'd like to ask before we wrap up for the evening. Well, if there's nothing at all, we will, do we have one more question? It's just one really quick question. Yes. I, want, I wanted to know if for a young press practitioner, uh, what would be the top three investments um, or investment type things to do for uh, extra stream of income with, mm -hmm. with us just starting out after uh, finishing residency? So that's a great question. Uh, real estate would be one. Real estate is a big one. I would say that's one. Um, two, I would look at, um, because you're not going to have a whole lot of money, to be honest with you, you know, is if you can partner in with um, um, another medical professional, you know, either an investment firm. Um, and then third, I would say just buy as much as you can. If you don't have to rent, buy. Buy a home, buy, um, buy your office space, because when you start leasing out, like for instance, I own my own practice, I lease out, I sublease part of my space to a vascular surgeon. And so, I mean, between us, my rent essentially is halfway, 50% paid, um, and he only comes to the office a half a day a week and doesn't get in my way, you know? So I would say um, that real estate and buy as much as possible. And if you can't buy, go through your student loans and whatever has the highest interest rate, you know, because obviously there are a bunch of them, knock out the highest interest rate because that is a form of investment in yourself. Okay. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Oh, that, that was sage advice during the whole hour. That was fantastic. So if nobody has anything else, we will uh, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Dr. Ross, again, we really, really thank you for your time. Um, and for everyone on the call, this is just the first of many other of uh, webinars that we're going to have in the Young Member Webinar Series. So keep an eye out on your emails and, uh, and social media for future posts. Um, and hopefully, Dr. Ross, will have a chance to invite you back again, because I think this is very valuable for everyone in attendance. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone. But thank you.